And I'd like to introduce a, um, Eva Garza de Walsh, and she is the vice chairman of the Public Lighting Authority. Thank you, Alexis. Well, we're so glad to be in your neighborhood tonight. We know that uh, lighting is very important to you, as it is to us. And we can tell also by the audience and how many people are here that it is a real important issue for you. And I can tell you that City Council and we have our Honorable Councilman James Tate here with us tonight. Let's give him a hand. City Council is also very concerned about lighting in the city of Detroit. And when you finish hearing what the mayor has to say tonight, you're going to see that this is one of the top priority quality of life issues for the mayor, for his administration, the Public Lighting Authority as well is supporting that because we believe in that as well. Everything is a impacted by the lighting in Detroit. We know that crime is, increases when there isn't any lighting in certain areas. So we're very concerned. We're pleased with the mayor's plan. I think you're going to be pleased as well when you hear how he's trying to accelerate this project, trying to get the lights on everywhere in Detroit. We have some pilot projects, but I'm going to let him tell you about that. But before we get started, I do want to introduce some of our board members on the Public Lighting Authority who are also helping with this major project. And we have Nicole Spielies. She's the engineer on the uh, board. We have David Jones. He's the attorney, myself, Eva Garza de Walsh. And then we have Otis uh, Jones, who's our executive director. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our mayor, who has this fantastic plan that we're all supporting. Thank you. And here is Mr. Mayor Duggan. All right. That's, you always love when the expectations are built up really high before you stand up. Uh, this has been an interesting process, and some of you may have heard this story, but... Uh, the day after I got elected, I sat down with the emergency manager, Kevin Orr, and we went through the list of things, and as he was discussing whether I was going to have any authority or not, uh, and we talked about public lighting, which I was pretty obsessed with in the campaign. And he said, I am removing the entire public lighting authority board January 1 and replacing them with five people that I can count on. And I said, wait a minute. When you replace those board members, they're going to be running the Lighting Authority for the next four years. That board should be selected by the mayor and city council. Uh, why don't you give the mayor and the council a chance? And he says, the mayor and the council will never agree on anything in this town. He says, that, that's a silly idea. I said, give us the first two weeks of January and see if we can do it. So he gave us until... January 15th, and unlike a lot of what you've seen in this town, we sat down, mayor and council together, came up with people that we thought represented the community. The men and women on the lighting authority are not getting paid, they're volunteering because they live in neighborhoods and they care about the lights. But on January 10th, we got a unanimous vote out of the city council to seat this board. It's the way we ought to operate. Uh, and then two weeks later, this board adopted the plan that I'm going to show you today, and we're going to answer your questions on. But uh, before I start, I just want to take a minute to introduce uh, one of my partners in this process who's been outstanding from the beginning, uh, your councilman, James Tate. Good evening, District 1. Yeah. Yeah. You give a round of applause for that. <laughs> I uh, wanted to say thank you uh, for the, uh, Mr. Mayor for coming out. Uh, you know, typically what we've had in uh, many years past, uh, we had PowerPoints that were sent out. We also had a couple of uh, diagrams and drawings, but it's rare that we actually have uh, the mayor come out not once but twice within a, uh, this, uh, uh, this area to really communicate one-on-one -on -one with the residents. Uh, and I think that's very important. So if you can just give them another round of applause, we really appreciate that. 
And you know what's, 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 what's even more uh, for me as a returning member awesome is to have a teammate who is uh, willing to listen and also learn from some of the things that we have uh, gained over the years. Uh, some of us have been talking about and, you know, just shortening the, the time frame of the plan and also uh, the issue of LEDs. Those are just some of the things. But when you have that, but then you hear some other things that have been added on, which are awesome, you guys are going to really, really appreciate what you see here this evening. So without further ado, it's not about me. Uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to say a couple of words to the folks here. and just uh, want to see some of your faces afterwards. I know you're going to be very pleased. So have a great evening, and we'll uh, be here to answer any questions afterwards. All right. Thank you, Councilman. All right. So uh, let me show you what uh, we're going uh, to propose here. And I'm going to take you through what the Lighting Authority adopted in 2013, what this new Lighting Authority has adopted, and how the two compare. Uh, and you can, you can form your own opinion as to whether we're headed the right direction. You've met the board members already. Here is the status of the lights in the city of Detroit today. We have 88,000 lights. About 44,000 of them work. And as you know, from day to day it varies which ones are on and which ones are off. All right, there's no pattern to it I can figure out. Sometimes they're on during the day and they're off at night. Uh, but uh, the way that those lights are made up, 53,000 of them are in neighborhoods on residential streets. About 20,000 are in alleys. And about 15,000 are on thoroughfares, the main road, the Fenkels, the McNichols, the Grand Rivers. That's the, the way the lights are split up uh, today. So that's the issue that this board is dealing with. How did we get here? The Public Lighting Authority got formed by a series of bills the legislature adopted at the end of 2012. And here's what they did. They took $12.5 million that the city was receiving in utility tax money that was going to pay for police officers. They took it from the police officers and moved it to the Lighting Authority. The reason they had to move it to the Lighting Authority is we need to borrow $160 million to light this city. And nobody would have loaned a nickel to the city of Detroit. Right? So they had to create this authority. Now the real question is, when you take $12.5 million out of the police, if we actually light this city and prevent crime, that's a good use of money from a public safety standpoint. But if we make bad decisions, we've hurt ourselves on public safety and we've hurt ourselves on the lighting. So last February, almost exactly a year ago, the lighting authority was adopted by the city council. Uh, how many of you have been at a past presentation by the lighting authority? Okay, so a number of you have heard the last one. What I'm going to say to you is going to seem uh, familiar. Right now, uh, the lighting authority in 2013 adopted two pilot areas. We're keeping those two areas. The one that matters is the one on the left. Uh, and the boundaries that, that we're in are bounded by Fenkel, McNichols, Southfield going west to the city border. And so what we are going to do is light these two areas, that and the, and the grassy and eight mile site on the east side. We're going to go through, put this plan in, and then the lighting authority is going to come through and look. And they're going to ask for your opinion. We think we have the right answer. But before we light 139 square miles of the city to the standard, we thought we ought to start off in three or four square miles, see how it looks, get some feedback, and then go forward. And so, uh, in a sense, you're the guinea pigs. Uh, there's an advantage of going first. Uh, and if we make a mistake, we're going to listen to you and we're going to adjust it uh, as we go forward. And so we have already, have we started putting the uh, LEDs in this neighborhood yesterday? Okay, so we've started uh, uh, yesterday. Before that, as you know, they were putting some lights on the corners. Here is the plan that the Lighting Authority adopted last year, the plan that was implemented uh, at the time I took office on January 1. First, the light fixtures. They made a decision to go to 100% the old sodium lights, the lights we've had historically. They did that to save money up front because the old sodium lights are cheaper to install 
or, or to buy than the LED lights. Of course, the LED lights cost less and are more energy efficient uh, when you have to maintain them. On the thoroughfares, on the main roads, here's what the Lighting Authority decided to do in 2013. Keep the same 15,000 lights we have today. On the main roads, we got about the right number of lights. But what the last year's Lighting Authority was very focused on overhead wires. About 85% of the lights on the main streets in this city are lit from above. You go over or wired from above. You go out, you'll see the power cord on most of the main streets right across the top of the light poles or across the wooden poles. The Lighting Authority wanted to move those uh, lights underground. Uh, and they thought aesthetically it would be better not to have the wires up in the air. Uh, but they didn't have enough to do all of it, and so the plan they adopted would have reduced the lights wired from the top from 85% to 73%. And that would have cost, and it planned to cost, $30 million to bury that much more uh, power line. Now, from my standpoint, if you go down McNichols today, and you look up, what will you see? You'll see the telephone wires. You'll see the power lines that power your house. You'll see the Comcast cable lines, which are up in the air. And you'll see the line, the, the line lighting uh, the street lights. As far as I'm concerned, I can't figure out how just taking that street light wire and putting it underground really changes the aesthetics of our main streets. Okay, would it be good over time if we got everything buried? Sure, but if we buried everything, we'd have gotten 10% of the city done. Uh, and so the last board decided to put $30 million into the underground wiring. What this board has said is, instead of putting $30 million in underground wiring, let's take that money, and instead of sodium lights, we're gonna go to LED lights. Uh, and, and I'll show you what else we're gonna do differently. Uh, the alleys. In 2013, the plan uh, that was adopted, there are 20,000 alley lights, they're taking them all down. Everyone, whether the lights were working or not. Uh, and if you wanted, uh, as a neighborhood group, to come together on alley lights, they didn't offer you an efficient option. Uh, on neighborhood lighting, they reduced the lights in the neighborhood from 53,000 to 30,000 lights. This is where they got the savings in, in order to pay for putting that, the thoroughfare wires underground. And so what that meant is, for every block in the city that's less than 600 feet, there would be no light in the middle of the block. That what the proposal was, was light the straight corners. No lights in the middle of the block. They couldn't afford lights in the middle of the block. They were paying to put the cable underground on the main road. If you have a working light in the middle of your block today, they were going to take it down because they couldn't afford to operate it. Can you imagine the reaction I would have had from you if this plan had gone forward and people started pulling down working lights from the middle of your block? Okay, it, That was the plan I was looking at in January. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, there, the Illuminating Engineering Society has standards, and, uh, and it's complicated. It has to do with, with the, the, the brightness and the height and the like. But basically, for the lights and the poles we're proposing, it's about one light every 250 or 300 feet in a neighborhood. And so when you're talking about a 600-foot block in a neighborhood, you would have absolutely been dark in the middle of that block, would not have met the national standards. When I'm looking at this and I say, where are our uh, uh, residents going? The Ferndales, the Harper Woods, they're all lit to the national standard. We were going to light this city uh, in a substandard way on the neighborhood side. So in the city of Detroit, we have about 13,000 blocks that are less than 300 feet. You don't need a mid-block light. The national standards say light in the two corners and a 300-foot block is just fine. 300 to 600 feet, there's another 11,400 blocks in this city. Last year's plan would have taken down any light in the middle of those blocks. That does not meet the national standards. At 300 to 600 feet, you have got to have a mid-block light. 
And then in the longer blocks, the 2013 plan did have uh, mid-block lights. Decorative lighting, which will be an issue to many people in this room. If you came to the earlier forums, I wasn't here, I'm just repeating what I'm being told, but basically there was no provision for historic poles in the plan that was adopted last year. Basically, you were going to get wood poles uh, with a sodium light hanging from it in this neighborhood. Now, uh, the light poles that were here originally were beautiful. I mean, really added to the neighborhood and the, and the whole environment. Now, we got some that are falling over, we got some that are rusted out and the like. But from my standpoint, there are a lot of historic neighborhoods in this community to whom having a light pole that fit the neighborhood was important. But at least the plan adopted last year offered no option. Uh, everybody got the same. And then they were going to get through the, everything by the end of 2016, three years to get that done. That's where we stood on January 1. Here's the plan that on January 29th this board adopted. On the lights. Today we have 100% sodium lights. The 2013 plan had 100% sodium lights. The plan this board adopted is going to 100% LED lights across this city. Okay? We're going to follow Chicago and Boston and every other city that is going from sodium to LED. We are going to light to national standards. On the main streets, today, 85%, as I told you, are wired from overhead. In 2013, their plan was to bury 12%. What we're saying is we can't afford to bury those wires. So what we're proposing is leaving 85% wired from above. It's wired from above today. We're going to leave it wired from above. And we're going to take that $30 million and put it into the neighborhoods and put it into the LEDs. In the neighborhood. Today, we got 53,000 lights. About half of them work. The 2013 plan had 30,800 lights. No light in the middle of a block under 600 feet. The new plan, 42,200 lights in neighborhoods. All the 300 to 600 foot blocks get a light in the middle of the neighborhood, and it will be the new modern LED light. So you can see what we did. We made a decision that the neighborhood blocks were more important than the overhead wiring. Okay, and there's about 125,000 homes on these blocks. So imagine the people in this city who would have been uh, reacting as people came and took down the lights that did work in the middle of their block. I'd, I'd have gotten a few phone calls on that. So, blocks in Detroit, if it's under 300 feet in 2013, they weren't proposing any in the middle of the block, we're not proposing any in the middle of the block. Okay? 300 foot block, corners are fine, that's the national standard. 300 to 600 foot block, 11,400, they proposed none, this authority has now adopted a plan with 11,400, and then for the rest of the neighborhoods, the numbers were the same. On the alleys, uh, here's what we've got. The alleys are technically, and they are legally, our backyards. I mean, there was a time when the alley was public, right? The garbage truck used to go down it, play the kids. How many of you remember when, when the alleys were public, right? I used to play in the alley as a kid, okay? But 30 or 40 years ago, the city vacated the alleys. They've gone to the property owners. In some neighborhoods, property owners have moved their fences. In other neighborhoods, they look like the alley just like they were before. But they are the backyards. We don't have the money to light the alleys. However, here's the difference. Today, we have 12,000 alley lights working. In 2013, they would go down and take down every alley light. We couldn't figure out why you want to go take down a working alley light. If it's providing light, why not leave it? And so what this authority is saying is, we're going to leave the 12,000 alley lights up as long as they're working. And when they do burn out, we're going to offer uh, an option, which DTE will do, which for $100, DTE will put the alley light in, and for $17 a month, they'll keep it lit. So whether you want to do it as a neighborhood association, whether you want to get together with four neighbors around you, the neighbor behind you, whatever it is, if you want 
your alley lit. We're giving you a cost-effective option, but we're just being honest with you. We cannot, in this plan, afford to light the alleys. We're going to light the street in front of your house, but we can't afford to light the alleys in the long run. Decorative lights. Uh, we want to preserve the decorative lights. And so what we are doing is this. Uh, we are saying to any community uh, that likes their decorative lights, uh, if you, you like the light that's there, we'll leave it. We'll replace the sodium head with an LED head. We'll leave the decorative light pole you got. If we can find replacement poles that match your existing poles, we'll buy replacement poles to keep the look of the neighborhood if that's what your neighborhood wants. But we're only going to put the same $800 into a pole that we're putting in all the other neighborhoods. It wouldn't be fair to say to your neighborhood, we're going to pay $1,000 a poll and not have that, you know, two miles away in, in any other community. So every community gets a poll worth $800. If your poll is continuing to function, we're going to leave it up. In some cases, they're so rusted out, uh, I, I don't have to tell you, uh, they're going to need to be replaced. And so we want to work with the Neighborhood Association, um, and, uh, uh, and if you want to keep the decorative poles, if you'll pay the incremental cost, uh, you can keep uh, those poles. Timetable. The 2013 plan, they were gonna get through the neighborhoods at the end of 16. That seemed ridiculously long. Uh, the new plan, we will have all the neighborhoods completely done by the end of next year. Uh, we're speeding up the process, we're putting people on 10 hour days, and we're gonna get through the neighborhoods. Uh, on the thoroughfares, we're still going to take till the end of 16. There is so much problem in the, in the part of our lighting system that's underground with circuits and the like. It's going to take that long. So we're going to be honest with people. Your neighborhood will be lit by the end of next year. All the thoroughfares will be lit by the end of 16. Um, and then, uh, so the plan this year, seven changes that this authority has approved. We're 100% LED lighting. We're lighting the middle of the blocks in the 300 to 600 foot blocks. We're leaving our 12,000 alley lights on until they burn out. You've got an option on neighborhood on alley lights. You've got an option if you want to keep your decorative lights in your neighborhood. We're going to shorten the timeline in your neighborhood to two years. We are going to give up uh, the overhead wiring uh, that was going to be put underground. That's the essential trade-off that we've made. What does this mean for you in this area? Um, in, in this neighborhood, this pilot area, we said, I put this uh, slide together a, a week or so ago, it said by February 28th, the LED lights are going to be installed. They got started being installed this week, so Otis Jones and his team have beaten that schedule. By the end of April, all of your lights will be in your neighborhoods. Uh, and then by the end of June, they'll be done on the thoroughfares, the Grand Rivers, McNichols, uh, Fenkel and the like. That'll be done by the end of June. And so we're going to be in a situation, I believe by late April, that we're all going to know whether this lighting plan works. And so the lighting authority is going to come out and look. I suspect they'll hold a public hearing, get your thinking, and then if this looks good, they'll extend this plan to the rest of the city. If we need to make changes, uh, we will make uh, changes. So that's what we're thinking, and that's where we're going. How does this sound to people? Okay. Sounds good to a few people. All right. And with that, uh, we'll take questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm sure we would love to keep our historical polls. Uh, there's only one problem. There's this thing called the Neighborhood Benefit Zone, better known as the Special Assessment District, that was passed some, let's call it four years ago, when the governor took office. City Council has not been able to enact it because the city law department has not submitted the language to city council for enactment. So we cannot implement our district and collect our fees from our residents to pay for a poll that may cost more than $800. That would be nice if you do nothing else. Okay. You, you, do that. So and then we can pay you, for you, whatever Your you information like. is out of date. You're talking about an old city law department. So the new corporation Council Butch Hollowell uh -huh. has jumped all over this. And he has moved the to documents to City Council. And James, where do we stand? 
Just had a meeting with Butch, as a matter of fact, uh, last, last week. <laughs> it's and a we're going to be meeting again next week with the follow-up. We've got a discussion document that's going to be coming uh, before the council, so we're moving extremely quickly. So we'll be able to get this done and, and, and get the residents' approval on this so that we can collect this in taxes this we're, summer. We're moving on it a lot quicker than, uh, the law department's moving a lot quicker than it Hallelujah. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, elections matter. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned the, the overhead lighting. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, lighting. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Excuse me. I guess sorry. you may end up on TV, so they want you to talk into the microphone. On the overhead lighting, uh, wiring for the lights, right. you said on the thoroughfares in the residential neighborhoods, how would that work? Because all of ours were done, switched yeah. to yeah. overhead lighting within the neighborhood. You, yours are going, I believe, to go back to underground, which they were originally, right, Otis? I'm going to let Otis Jones answer that. Yes, good question. Uh, a lot of the lights that are in historical nature, right, was put overhead. Yeah. Uh, we're going to put those back underground. Uh, so. Right. So if, if it was originally wired underground, we're going to rewire it underground. So in your neighborhood, in a number of cases, the underground wiring broke, so they started stringing the, the wires up above. We're going back to the underground lighting for those, those historic poles. All right. Yes. Uh, we also have historic poles uh, over in Grandmont. Uh, we got a grant back in the 90s, and we replaced all of ours. We did not know that they were going to be fiberglass. And now cars have taken all of them out because they snap. We, 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 we've had eight or nine gone because of that. Uh, I'm concerned about, the number one, the quality. Uh, you know, even if we get replacement and historical kind of lighting. What kind of quality are we going to get? What kind of warranties are going to be on the equipment when we have, you know, like within a few years, lost uh, so many of our lights? So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, this is one of these issues where we're going to work with the community on. I'm sorry, this is one of these issues we're gonna work with the community on, okay? You're right, uh, you had some historical poles there, they were taken out, they were put, fiberglass was put in. Uh, we understand that the community uh, has expressed to us that they don't like that. But at the end of the day, we, as the mayor mentioned, we've got a budgeted amount, and we're gonna sit down uh, as we go through and, and say, hey, here are some options with the community and uh, figure out the right solution for that. If, if you uh, move the uh, wires underground in the neighborhoods, how are you going to protect them from being stolen? Uh, so uh, most of the, the wiring that we would move underground uh, in this instance is going to be in those hysterical areas. And uh, we're going to rely a lot on the residents. Uh, th those lights that were historical lights uh, in the Rosedale area, we're going to put them back underground. So uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to rely on each other uh, for you to call when you see something strange, uh, and uh, it's in the neighborhood. So yeah, we're, we're we're going to rely on a little more than that. Uh, there there is a bill in Lansing right now which we're actively engaged on that goes after the scrapyard owners that is critical to get done. Uh, <laughs> And what that bill says is bottled up a committee, but I'm going up to spend some time with the Republicans to see if we can't get it out, uh, is that when you take your uh, scrap to the scrapyard, uh, you will be paid by check. That check will be mailed to you three days later to an address you provide uh, so that we have a clear record. Uh, and it also will allow the police to make arrests on anybody who's inside a house who can't prove they belong there. So you call on a scrapper, the police show up and they say, it's my uncle's house, he said I could take it. The police are kind of at a disadvantage. The new law is going to provide for a rebuttable presumption that you don't belong, uh, which means if you can't provide ID showing you belong, the police can make uh, an immediate arrest. The other thing is that Butch Hollowell, our new corporation counsel, in addition to doing your uh, special Assessment District uh, is also uh, working on a forfeiture process so that when we document scrapyard owners buying stolen material, we're going to move to forfeit those scrapyards. I did this when I was the prosecutor. 
I had the scrapyard owners come in and complain to me. Why are you being so mean to me? I don't know whether this stuff's stolen or not. And I'd say to them, you know, when a guy is going down the street pushing a shopping cart <laughs> filled with aluminum siding, you got a pretty good idea he didn't come about it by lawful means. I don't have any sympathy for you. We're going back to those days. Right. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Mr. Um, Mayor. <clears throat> this may be slightly tangential, but there are a number of lights out on the south field in I-96. I'm not sure that this authority is responsible for those, but what efforts are being made to coordinate the upgrade of those lights? Some of them are recently installed, but nevertheless, there are large stretches of the freeway that are dark. I, I, I sat down with the director of MDOT. Uh, that system is an MDOT system. And interestingly, the freeway lights are not just out in Detroit. They're out in Oakland and Macomb County. The state of Michigan is not maintaining their freeway lights, which is a point I've made to the governor, who's certainly given enough speeches about Detroit not getting his lights on. Uh, and so we don't have a specific commitment, uh, but the governor, uh, every time he sees me, he knows I'm going to raise two things. When are you going to get the graffiti off the freeway overpass sides? And when are you going to get the freeway lights out? I'm going to stay out until it gets done. Mr. Mayor, uh, who would we contact? Uh, I live right in the middle of a block alongside of Cook School on Stahalen. The light fixture, the light pole rotted out. So who would we contact in order to get that repaired? Because it's no longer visible. Are you in the pilot area? Yes. Uh, that poll, if you're in the pile area, will be addressed, as the mayor said, uh, you, you, it's a residential street? It's a resi residential street right along uh, the side of Cook School on Stahalen. Okay, it's right in the middle of the, the block. Of, it, that that poll, and that's, that will be completed by the end of April as a part of our work. Oh, Otis, okay. Thank if you. If you were a politician, <laughs> you would go get that young woman's address, and you would speed up the fixing of that poll, all right? And, and, and we're going to work on that together, right? <laughs> we're both going to walk over to you. <laughs> um, the, the, the issue with the uh, Southfield uh, and the lights along the freeway, did have an opportunity to speak with the uh, folks over in MDOT as well. Now, they gave us a soft commitment, Mr. Mr. Mayor, of saying that by the end of February, the lights are going to be on. Now, they indicated that there was some type of issue with the contractor. Um, but once again, it's this legalese that they indicated that has prevented them from allowing those lights to be on. But they have a very soft, a soft commitment of by the end of February, those lights being on on the freeway. Working together? Every mile we light up, I'm going to get louder and louder with the governor about the freeways. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, qualif or, um, a qualification and a question. When you talk about the um, lights on the south field, what about the service drive lights? Are they MDOT or are they I city? think the service drives are ours, right? Uh, they are ours, and they'll be done uh, as, as if they're part of the area of the pilot area, they'll be done by uh, June. Um, the, my second part of my question is there's a signal light at Puritan and Southfield that's been out since Christmas. Traffic light. A traffic light. Is that uh, MDOT or City? No, that's, uh, that's Gary Brown. Uh, so, uh, Ron, uh, would you be a, make it a point to ask Gary tomorrow to fix the uh, traffic light at Puritan and Southfield? Uh, so, uh, no, that's, uh, that's, our, uh, that's our own DPW. We, don't, we can't blame anybody else on that one. Uh, go, okay, you got a microphone. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, I live in Boston, Edison, and we have we spent 20 years getting new lights and light poles, and it was designed to stop the you know the thieves from taking the um, the copper, and plus it's cost effective, cost cost effective, and also they are um, more easily replaced than any other type of pole. But the question I'm asking you, we have uh, problems with uh, our light bulbs being not being replaced, and when I call the uh, DPL, they said that it's um, the authority, and then the authority says it's it's the Detroit Lighting Department. So we can't even okay. get. So let me let me tell you the truth. The truth is, if it's in the pilot areas, it's Otis 
and the Lighting Authority. If it's in Boston Edison, it's me. Uh, so uh, what's going to happen is, as the Lighting Authority goes through this city, they'll take over the lights they replace. But until they get there, it's the City of Detroit and the Public Lighting Department that's responsible uh, for replacing your lights. They're out there every day. Uh, so how and, do we get to you to get yeah, the, and to so, have them to do you know, uh, what and we so, need? So the question, and the question is, do we have a burned out bulb or do we have some serious infrastructure issues? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, we uh, just had new light poles put in within okay. the last eight So years. I don't know. Do you want to, Nicole, this is your neighbor. Do you know anything yeah. about this? Um, well, I, I was, I, I, hi, Daryl. I, um, <laughs> he's very familiar. He was the neighborhood president at the time when we went through a lot of work in that neighborhood to get the lights in and uh, originally didn't even put in enough lights and then we had more lights added. It's all underground. It's all new in the last 10 years or so. I think it's generally just the light bulbs don't last that really? long. Yeah. So I don't think it's an infrastructure thing there, but that's all right. um, my, the surface. All right. So, John, would you ask Gary to speed up the Boston Edison light bulb replacement? All right. So we're bringing, we're bringing Gary Brown with us the next time. Who's next? Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Mayor. When a, yes, when, the, uh, when a light pole is taken down by a traffic accident, First of all, whose responsibility is it to have that pole replaced, to pay for it, and what is the turnaround time for having that pole replaced? So the, the answer is going to be this. The, the lighting authority will replace the pole. If we're in a neighborhood where the neighborhood group is paying an extra $200, then we'll pay the first $800, and the neighborhood group would pay the extra $200. And Otis, what are you looking for as far as turnaround time on repairs? Uh, we'll have it from uh, have it repaired within five days from the time you uh, notify us. So when a poll is taken out five days later, yep. it will be up and again. Yep. yep. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, excuse me. I'm not uh, leaving until we answer all the questions. So there's no hurry. Go ahead. Thank you for coming again, Mayor. Um, looking at this graph here, I just want to make sure that we're on point with this pilot program. It appears that it ends at Finkel. From Grand River to Finkel? No, it's, yeah, yeah, this gentleman's right. It's from Six Mile to Finkel. Uh, Six Mile is the uh, northern boundary, Finkel is the southern boundary. And then it goes over to the east to Sawfield and then back over to Telegraph and the Five Points. Because I'm on the north side of Finkel, which is a grid 113. You're good. You're good. We're good. Because we've been out without lights for roughly four years. Well, and I know you said- it's good you're in the pilot area. Okay. <laughs> and you said you wasn't doing it politically, but is there any way that we could speed up the process? I, 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 I'm not sure how soon you thought you were gonna get lights, but getting this neighborhood done by the end of April by government standards is pretty good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yes, thank you. And thank you for coming, we appreciate yeah. this. Um, I got the impression that when you were talking about alley lights, you were talking about the uh, alley line between uh, uh, houses, right. between streets. Right. Now, uh, some of our streets, as you broaden this beyond the pilot area, I think, are going to have uh, a commercial alley at the ends of the block, where the commercial frontage, say on Grand River, there's commercial frontage, then there's an alley, and then it picks up on the uh, residential area. Are there any plans to put lighting in there or, you go, man. or maintain that lighting? And one other thing, is the price you're giving $800, is that, is that a firm price? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's, if we were to go uh, to uh, uh, any other neighborhood in this city, uh, we're putting $800 a pole into their neighborhood. It would not be fair to have fewer lights in one area so another neighborhood could have $1,000 lights. So the $800 uh, number is, is decided. Uh, the lights along Grand River are, are going to stay where they are. So if you've got a light at Grand River in an alley, it's going to stay. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the, if it's along Grand River at the alley, it's going to stay. Uh, as far as the commercial alley itself, it's going to be up to the business people. So the business people, if once you get into the alley, it'll be up to the business people in the alley, uh, and they've got a $100 Edison deal available to them. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Yes. 
Here. I hear the voice. Oh, there you are. Yeah. All right. Hi. How are you? Okay, I have a, a question. Can I ask you, would you, when you introduce yourself, would you tell me your name and what street you're on? Okay, my name is Felicia C.A. and I live on Hayden Street, okay. um, Six Mile Evergreen. I am here, also for one, to find out about, you know, the Lighting Authority. Also, to ask, um, do you have any idea when my son's school will have power again? We have been... Mm out of power for four days going on tomorrow. He goes to base academy. Um, we had 30 schools that were out. Now he's one of six schools that are out. Right. And I'm trying to find out. I, I want answers because we are invested in our child's education and we want the best for our child just like any other parent here. And so they can't give us a timeline on when my child can go back to school. I mean, the same thing happened in December, a week right. before. And the grids, like the grids, like why did they switch the grid over from DTE to Detroit Power Authority like while school was going on? No, they didn't. So I, I want to stay on lighting tonight, but let me answer the question because your child's out of school. Is the public light, the, it's essentially a power department. We call it the public lighting department. But the power department uh, has got an infrastructure that is absolutely crumbling. There have been conversations with DTE going on for some time for DTE to run their own power lines and just let the city of Detroit get out of the way. I am working every day to speed up that process. So it didn't switch. Uh, the schools have been on the city power for a while. What we need to do is speed up getting them onto DTE power. And I'm talking to the CEO of DTE about switching over the schools and the traffic lights first because in many cases the traffic lights are out for exactly uh, the same reason. But we've got a power infrastructure that's been neglected for probably 30 years, uh, and we got to get DTE to put in a new system. Okay, I understand what you're saying, but in the meantime, <laughs> our kids are suffering right. because my child can't go to school because... There's no power. So do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? I mean, I know what, what you're hear? saying, but I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's, just it's, it's very, very frustrating right. for a parent right. who wants their child, my child likes to go to school, so who wants their child to go to school is very, very frustrating. Right. So These cable lines are rotted and they're overloading uh, and we need to get switched off of them as fast as possible. And, and I know they're trying to get the school back on right now. Whether it'll be out in the morning, I can't tell you. The crews are working on it. Uh, but the solution is to get us off this crumbling grid and over to DTE as quickly as possible, and I'm working on it. But it won't be something that's going to happen fast. I wish I could tell you something else, but it, it, it won't happen fast. Um, actually, my question was very much like hers regarding infrastructure. Um, is PLD at some point going to go away yes. and be totally replaced by PLA as this migration right. occurs? So, so you're asking good questions and the people in the, the city who, who appreciate the difference. So here's what's happening. PLD, the Public Lighting Department, replaces the street lights in the city today. Every time Otis and the authority roll through an area like your area, from then on out, it's entirely the Public Lighting Authority. They're going to maintain all the new LED lights. So by the end of 2015, PLD will be completely out of the business of lights in the neighborhood. By the end of 2016, they'll be completely out of lights in the thoroughfare. And as fast as we can get the power grid switched over to DTE, they'll be off of that what, as well. What about their generating capacity? Is that going to That's be what I'm saying. Is that we're, we're, it it's, it's dying of its own. We just want to get switched over to DTE before it dies. Yeah. Uh, 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 one other quick thing. I've got a whole laundry list here, but I'll just yeah. do one more. Um, how are the new lights going to be controlled as far as their on and off cycles? Right now, I understand PLDs are, are using manual knife switches to power up parts of the grid at night. And um, in many neighborhoods I drive through, there are a lot of lights that are on 24-7, probably because they just got hardwired to DTE or something, and there are other lights, of course, that aren't on at all. So I'm just wondering, are they going to be on a photo cell? Are they going to be on a, a civil twilight schedule or be able to be turned on during bad weather, et cetera? How, how is that part of it going to work? It's uh, that's just a operational. Good question. We get that question all the time. They will be on a photo cell. So, uh, for those of you who don't know quite what a photo cell does, is it actually detects the sun rays and turns the light on and off as the sun comes up and go down. 
uh, and this gentleman is correct. Currently, that's not the way it is at all. However, uh, it will be on a photo cell. Mr. Mayor, back here. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. My name is Zenobia Wada, and I'm actually the community safety coordinator for Cody Rouge. And with all due respect with the pilot program, the pilot areas you're focusing on, um, if we could ask the board to also look at the public lighting that's surrounding the schools. On the west side, there's only so many high schools, middle schools, but the, tr the, tr uh, the path, the route that the young people take to and from school, there's a, not a lot of lighting. So we could ask the board to also look at that as well, such as Chicago, Plymouth. There's not a lot of lighting, but a lot of young people travel from to Henry Ford High School over here to Cody High School um, going towards Joy Road. So if you can also take a look at that, because when you come to public safety, those young people fear going to and from school, especially traveling at 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. So if you can also take a look at that. That'd be yeah, great. It's, a, it's, it's a great suggestion. The uh, neighbors in the Eight Mile and Gratiot Forum made the same suggestion. And so the board committed to looking at is there an efficient way to stage this where our schools will be given preference. And I know they, they committed to do that. But it's a great suggestion. Yes. Mr. Oh, Mayor. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thank you and your board for uh, coming out. I have a way of um, a suggestion. Uh, oftentimes the trees, um, the the lights that we have are buried in the trees. And we used to have an arborist uh, department that would come and trim the trees back, and I feel that those LED lights would be ineffective if they're buried in the trees. So what we're gonna do is when we install the new lights, uh, we're gonna go through and we're gonna clear all the shrubbery out, right? Uh, and then we're gonna get on a maintenance schedule like most cities in America do, where they come around and maintenance it and, and make sure that that shrubbery stays removed. Yeah. Good evening. Hi. Here. My name is Sandra Pickens. I'm vice president for Littlefield Community Association, and we're on Wyoming. And the question I have for you is similar to the other lady. We have schools over in our area, which is off of Wyoming and Fullerton, and we're having a problem. There are no lights right. from Grand River down to Schoolcraft, and no lights from Fullerton all the way down to, uh, I guess you can say, Ewall Circle or Livernois. And my question is, there, is there any way that we can get those lights on, even though we're not part of the pilot program, but we have handicapped children that are coming to Noble School, and we need lights on over there. Yeah, and so as I said, the group, as they put together their rollout plan, has committed, I don't wanna say we're gonna pick this neighborhood over that yeah. neighborhood, they need to make a decision, but if there's any way to efficiently target the areas around schools, they are gonna target those first. I would appreciate that, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Doris Dickhoot, Glastonbury Avenue. Um, one question was answered, and that's our beautiful trees, that, that really is an issue. The other would address the engineers, or are you gonna have inspectors who check the poles prior to the installation of the light? Because it makes no sense to put a gigantic pole up on a disintegrating base. Yes, that's correct, ma'am. Uh, what we do is we have a process where we go through and we get, uh, we go through and we survey every light. Uh, every light will be surveyed first uh, in a particular neighborhood, and then we design, and then we go to construction. So that's our process. Good evening. My name is Annie May Holt, and I resonate the same sentiment uh, these last two speakers regarding the safety in our young people. And I am not in the pilot area. I'm so in fact, I'm south of uh, Finkel, between Schoolcraft and Finkel, Southfield and Evergreen. My name is Annie May Holt, and I'm part of the Grandmont Number no. One Neighborhood Association. And I know personally where the young people catch a bus, which is on Piedmont and Linden. That light has been out for years. And I know that our president, Oliver Cole, has been contacting someone just simply trying to get, apparently, a light bulb to hang from, to hang so that the uh, young people do not have to stand in the dark. So my question is, who is it we are supposed to contact for that kind of si situation? So, so uh, that's the public lighting department still. So if you will, John, would you raise your hand, please? This is John Roach, our communication director. If you will give that location to John at the end of the meeting, we will have them go out. And if it's something that's, that's readily fixable, we'll get at it right away. Okay. 
Um, sir, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, I, my name is M. Day, and I'm with the 6 and 8 Police Community Relations Organization. We have a, a, a light on, on the block on Outer Drive. Um, it's more like a corner light. So who do we ask? Sure. John, see, to John, turn John that raise on. your hand. He didn't know he was going to be the lighting guy when he started. Okay. Uh, but I all the P thing. anybody who has a specific light that's outside the pilot areas, John Roach is going to personally take your light location to the PLD. Now, depending on what the problem is, we may or may not be able to fix it promptly, but I will promise you somebody will look at it promptly. Uh, all right. So any other, if you have another light location, go talk to, to, talk to John. Yes. My name is Cheryl Labash. I live on Chapel Street between uh, Puritan and, which, what's the street north of me? South of Vern. Uh, Florence, between Florence and Puritan. Um, I'm a city of Detroit retiree, and, you know, I don't, with, I do this with the greatest respect. The situation with the alleys is not that it's our backyard, because there are utilities there. There are sewers and there are, other, you know, lighting uh, wires. So it's not really the case that people can just move their fences back. Um, I worked in DPW 40 years ago. The alleys weren't vacated. There's a vacation process, and the neighbors have to sign up. A certain, especially if the alley is used. If you have garages that open into that alley, you can't close the alley. You can't fence it off. Um, so it's not as, you know, I, I see what you're saying, but it's just not that easy. And if people start moving their fences back and somebody has to get in there to fix the sewer or fix the, you know, the lighting wires or whatever, It, it, it varies from neighborhood to neighborhood, but you're right. Right. And I'm really glad that there's a solution for alley lighting because um, one of the, the light behind my house was removed by DTE because it wasn't working when they put the new pole in. And we really, you know, and I'm willing to pay for it, uh, assuming my pension isn't cut too drastically in the coming weeks. Uh, um, and also, I, there are two mid-block poles in my block. Uh, does that mean you're going to be taking one of them out? If, you're, if your block is less than 600 feet, I think there's a good chance that we will, yes. Okay. Uh, Chris Allen on Breton Drive. I've been in this community over 35 years. I want to thank you for your energy, and I'm glad you're lighting a fire. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Who's got the microphone? You do now. Mr. Mayor, yes. we want to welcome you to North Rosedale Park. I'm Victor Grisham, and I'm pleased that you love the city so much. All right. I hope you guys are still going to like me in six months. This is nice. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Emmett Foster, West uh, Six Mile, McNichols area. Um, I hear the plan here. It sounds grand for today. What about the millennials that are here, your second and third generation business owners? What is the guarantee that the update and there's going to be reinvestment long after you might be gone and including authority here? Because it seems like a lot of people invest, uh, inherited an imploding system. So what is their guarantee 10 years from now that there's going to be upgraded maintenance? Yeah, th there is no guarantee anywhere in the world 10 years from now. Uh, but what you have is uh, you have a system being put into place an LED light on average needs to be replaced how often? Every 15 to 20 years. Uh, and so the surest uh, guarantee that you have is to be vigilant in the people that you elect. Hello. Hello. Yes. Chandra Haynes. I'm Chandra Haynes over here. Um, I live in Sherwood Forest, and we want to know if the Historic Commission has to approve the lampposts that we want for our community. Yes, we will be working with the Historic Commission, and uh, we have started some of those conversations, but the answer is yes. Good question. I hadn't heard that one before. I learn every time. Who's got the microphone? I have a decorative light that's working, a little rusted at the bottom. But that's my, I love my light, and it has one of those little blue things at the top, so I guess that's 
um, photosensitive. So when they come to my poll, and it works, and it's a little beat up, but I like it, are they just not going to do anything? I don't need a new light bulb. Are they, am I going to keep my pole? And what does this $800 pole look like? Is it just a wooden? I mean, nobody has said what the basic pole is. It's a wooden pole. It's a fiberglass pole. It's a metal pole. So let me take the first part of that question uh, first. Uh, so before we touch the pole, we go through and assess whether or not it's structurally sound. Uh, and if it is, then we, you know, we refurbish it, we leave it there, and we, uh, we, we go ahead and, and switch it over to LED, okay? The, the second part is uh, the $800. What we're going to do is work with the neighborhood association groups here, and we're going to give a, a, a list of poll options uh, and, and come up with whatever poll that community thinks works for them. And this will happen before April? Yes. Yep. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Trevor Layton. I live on Warwick, south of Fenkel, so I know it'll be a while for us. But I just wanted to confirm that, so if there's a block that's, um, say, less than 300 feet and it's got a light post in the middle of the block, the light's out. As you're uh, going through that block and doing whatever maintenance is required, it, is a light post where the lamp is already out, does that get equal priority for getting removed as putting in a new light on another post? Yeah, as the mayor said earlier, if we have a block that's, that's 300 feet, then, you know, having a light at each one of those corners meets the national standards. So that pole will come out. Okay, so yeah. basically, as, as lights are being put in where they're supposed to be put in, posts that aren't working will be taken out at the same time. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it may not be the same day. They're different crews, but in the same process through the same timeline. Any other questions? So my big question is, are they going to get rid of those ugly plastic things that go around the poles on the Southfield service drive when they replace the light? Yes, we are having ugly plastic things. Okay. The ugly plastic things are going away. What those ugly plastic things did was try to hide that there's quail in the bottom of the pole, and they was trying to prevent uh, the copper thieves from stealing that. Well, the new... Uh, poles and the new system that we're putting in, it won't have that. Call, that coil is coming out. We're going to a new circuitry system that doesn't require it. So the ugly plastic things will be gone. All right. We've had a couple of the poles, as people know, taken out by uh, drivers. You know, the historical poles along Grand River and some of the poles in the neighborhood. I'm a real big believer in if you tear it up, you ought to pay for it. And now that the police have gone back to being the police, they go out and actually take accident reports in person. Um, what is the possibility that we can pursue these people to pay for the polls they take out? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just not going to I'm going to introduce you to Butch Hollowell, our corporation counsel, because he is, he is on that. He is on trying to find uh, uh, collections where it's reasonable to collect. We're not going to spend a lot and of time. And I have the name of the officer and the people who took out the poll on ours, as well as the license plate number. So okay. should I contact Butch? Uh, you, John, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> John, John, you and I will be John talking. is going to put you in touch with Butch. Please. All right. All right. So how does this, how do you guys like this? Does this plan feel like the right thing to do? Who thinks this is the right thing to do? How many like the old plan better? Not too many. Uh, and as far as this process of having a forum and talking like this, do you like this? Okay, so we're going to, as we continue to bring out blight plans and, and other plans, we're going to continue to have these kinds of meetings. I learn an awful lot. Uh, and last words, Ava? Just that we're very, very interested in what the community is saying, what their concerns are. The mayor is very interested. He's asked us to convene these meetings on a regular basis, especially after the project is done. We want to know from you firsthand whether it has worked so that we can duplicate it, as the mayor said, in other neighborhoods, and we can quickly move into these other neighborhoods and duplicate it. So, you know, we, we're listening. This is why we're here. We want to move quickly, and we want to be successful, and we want to make the lights work for the long term for everyone. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight.